Making his hat-trick appearance on the Mouthcast, on the other end of this telephone, Mark Morris. Hello. Nice to be back. For the third time. <laughs> it's an honour. Uh, well, we talked last February, and uh, you've just put out A Flash of Darkness to the pledges who've taken part in the campaign. Oh, yeah. And now the album's on the verge of full and fitting wider release on Acid Jazz Records. Mm-hmm. So, exciting times. Yeah, busy. Busy, busy, busy times, because, of course, I do everything myself these days. I'm self-managing, and yeah. therefore I've got, to be, I've got to be responsible. Switched on always. It's not like the good old days when I could just turn up for the show. You signed with Acid Jazz last summer. How did that come about? Well, I've, I've, I've been playing in Matt Berry's band for about the last year and a half. And um, he's been an acid jazz artist for the last three years, maybe four years. They released his album Witch Hazel. And so because I was working quite closely with him, I got to, to know the people at acid jazz quite well. And also, you know, I got kind of like an insider's view of how they operated. And I was just, I was just incredibly impressed with the with the work that they put in to work in Matt's record, to getting it out into the shops, to getting the posters up, to letting people know it was out there. And when it came to the point when I was speaking to labels and looking to license the album, um, I wanted to have a conversation with them. And well, it just made complete sense. I knew them, they knew me. I knew that they were a good label. So let's just let's go for it. It did seem like a really good fit for you. Yeah, it's a very small operation. I've been to some other labels, and even even though they're relatively small, there were still, and this this sounds like a terribly snobby and probably not the best way to make a business decision, but there were lots of people working there, and I felt I wanted to work. uh, What what impressed me with Acid Jazz was there's like a handful of people there. There's like five people there, tops. And so you go for a meeting, and you're meeting everyone from the top down. Um, everyone can be around the table. There's no miscommunication. And a label like that needs to have a record work for, for the label to exist. So you know that there's a lot of focus on you. And the fact that they want to work your record means that they believe that they can make it work. So it just felt right for so many reasons. And those uh, personal relationships are important so that everything's done right. I believe so, yeah. I mean those kind of conversations that you have to have with people where you can look each other in the eye and you know what's expected of one another and you know they're going to deliver their very best, that's all you can ask. Yeah. What does uh, being signed actually offer an artist such as yourself these days? Well, I think it gives me a window on a hopefully a larger audience. Doing the pledge campaign was wonderfully liberating at the time. It's something I would certainly consider doing again as well. But there's only so far I can take that in terms of promotion and advertising for the record, which is always the key, really, letting the world know it exists. So, I mean, m- m- my fan base were aware of it, or a nice chunk of my fan base were aware of what I was doing, so I was able to fund the thing. And then you've got big ambitions. <laughs> you know, you don't, you don't want to put all this time and effort into a record and then just have it sit there. You know, you hope it can go out into the world and make some more friends. first release to come out on Acid Jazz was just before Christmas, the EP This Is The Lie and That's The Truth, which uh, we'll talk about in a minute. On that EP were several themes that you'd written for the audio books of David Walliams' children's stories. Yeah, that's right. That's not a bad gig to land. That's a nice little, it's been a nice little sideline for me, yes. I've been doing that for about the last five years. And that came about because of my sort of personal friendship with David. And... Um, but you know, when he wrote his first book and Harper Collins told him that they're going to have it works and they have music bookending the chapters and all that sort of thing, he just got on the phone to me and said, fancy doing it. <clears throat> and uh, I was hoping to branch out into more of this sort of thing, more kind of instrumental work and different sort of arrangements and a platform to be able to express those ideas. And so it was perfect. And the nice thing is that I get to keep all the recordings as well. It's funny you should mention instrumental work, actually, because that makes me think of soundtracks. And the single, I felt, as a sort of early 70s American movie soundtrack thing going on. You know, that kind of wistful Midnight Cowboy, The Graduate Uh, thing. Funny you should say that, because I was watching something last night. Um, I was watching a film called Going South, 
Do you know it? It's an old 1970s western. It's not not really a western. It's set in the old west, but it's Jack. I think it's Jack Nicholson's debut as director. I could be mistaken, but the music for that was composed by Van Dyke Parks and this other fellow. I can't remember the chap's name, but I'm going to seek it out if I can find it anywhere. This, but it was brilliant and melodic, and it felt like it was perfect accompaniment for the movie, but also something that you could listen to independently, something that's got its own strength, its own melody. I mean, you've got to be able to whistle a tune. You've got to be able to hum it back to someone when you hear something. I think that's the difference between, say, uh, the music from... Narnia, right? Then the line, the witch in the wardrobe. Can you can you can you hum that theme tune? No, but but then Indiana Jones, everyone knows that. And I, and for me, you know, I wanted to do something where I where I just let the melody take over, and you write these pieces of music where they have a character of their own, which is kind of a, an accompaniment and sort of like a a companion piece to the to the images or the words in this case. I talk to myself a lot more these days. Which is good. I dine by myself a lot more these days. Which is good. I wake up alone a lot more these days. Which is good. I talk to myself a lot more these days. Yeah, I think there's quite a bit of that on the album. Uh, Cobb's Whaler, for instance, a kind of bossa nova thing. Title track, Flash of Darkness, which begins like a. Oh, yeah spaghetti western the bell chiming in the distance and all that i guess being solo these days you're able to um take those experiments as far as you want uh, it depends i mean often in my experiences in the blue tones we were generally speaking all reading from the same page when we came to the studio anyway and we would hammer things out before we got there uh, in the rehearsal room and so we all knew what we wanted it and we'd demo things and we'd all agreed that, that things were sounding right in certain sections and not quite right in certain sections and it was strange I mean we used to freak producers out because we had we all spoke in one voice all the time even when they tried to do that kind of interrogation thing where they you know get our opinions one at a time when you sort of wander into the studio on your own and the producer plays you something like Ed would go in and say no 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 snare drum's too loud and then he'd, he'd leave and then Scott would go in and Scott would hear it and he'd say exactly the same thing snare drum's too loud or you know a producer would try something out try an effect out and we'd go in the studio and, you know and go nah I'm not sure about that leave it on there see what the others say but I'm not sure and everyone would say the same thing so I was lucky in that regard but this I, I, I see what you mean there's, there's no one for me to have to consult I mean that's a good thing and it's also a slightly frustrating thing sometimes you've got to come up with it all yourself <laughs> and there's no springboard into an idea do you know what I mean yeah so who would you use as a sounding board? What well, now? Well, Gordon, the guy I'm in the studio with, the guy, he, he plays drums on everything and, and records it all. To a degree, him, but Gordon's... One of the great things about Gordon is he's got so many ideas, but he's so unprecious about any of them. So you can say, nah, and he doesn't get a sulk, or doesn't feel like he's uh, being overlooked, because he'll he, he, he just throw something else at you 30 seconds later, and that's just the sort of person he is. And for me, it's been a perfect marriage because sometimes you do need someone to just come in and suggest something that you would never have thought of or that you can't see because you're looking too closely at something. I mean, now I write in a similar way than I, as I did when I was in the band. I write songs, get into a certain stage, and then just kind of leave them until I got to the rehearsal room and then let everyone else colour them and express themselves. Sell yourself as a saviour Sell yourself as a saint Judging from your behavior, it's pretty clear that you ain't. But do you carry a darkness you can always suppress? How long you can keep it down? Are you about to uh, go out on tour w with a full band? That'll be the first time in quite a while you've played with a band, since, since the Blue Tones, in fact. Well, it's, I actually did some gigs last May. I did three nights last May with a band, and that was good fun. But, yeah, with the full band. <clears throat> I'll let you into something of an open secret here. The band that I'm going out with is... Da -da -da, the Blue Tones. And, and again, it's that weird thing that I was just kind of talking about, because over the last few months, seeing Ed and seeing Adam and seeing Scott socially, and sort of separately, because they all live all over the place, uh, they each said to me, when you take the album out on tour, if you need a guitarist, give us a shout. You know, and it was like, if you, need, you know, if you need a drummer, you know, I can always get a bit of time off, let us know. 
And so Scott as well, it's like I'm itching to play again, so you need a bass player. So I just thought, well, they're all itching to get out and play, and it's not a case of like, we, no, no, no one wants to revive the blue tones or anything like that. It's just that we want to have our cake and eat it. We just want to play together again. And this way, it's nice for them because it's not the same sort of pressure that they would have had before. They can just turn up as jobbing musicians and play my songs. And it's nice for me because I don't know I've got my old bandmates around me, and there's a group of musicians who I trust more than any other. Uh, last December, you toured on Shed 7's annual Christmas Knees Up. Yeah. Uh, I guess the venues were larger and the crowds uh, probably drunker than usual. Yeah. Do those kind of shows fuel your appetite? Might we uh, expect a big stadium rock sound <laughs> next album? They, uh, yeah, well, they, well that, it made me miss that element of being in the Blue Tones, playing in these lovely, lovely rooms with great PAs and the sound on the stage is great and the facilities are great and you know you're going to be looked after. You know what I mean? Not mollycoddled, but everything's going to work and you're going to have a lovely room to play to. And it made me miss that element of it. But no, I won't be trying to uh, adapt my style to make it happen. I'll just keep on doing what I'm doing and wait till the world catches up. <laughs> Everything stops dead when I'm thinking about my little space I tend to lose my thread